Hi. Thanks for coming to San Francisco. Thank you. Well, I am her biggest fangirl. I love her so much. So ah. You're sitting here next to me talking to me about the book. is just, I feel so completely honored. Oh, you're so sweet. So I, I think I'm supposed to do something super official because this is the Commonwealth Club, actually. I almost forgot. One moment, please. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Are you ready for this? <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome <laughs> to the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> this program is part of the club's Good Lit series underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. I'm Kelly Corrigan, author of Tell Me More, stories about the 12 hardest things I'm learning to say. I'm also the creative director and writer in residence for the Nantucket Project, and I am your moderator for today's yeah. program. It is now my pleasure to introduce Marsha Gay Harden, Academy and Tony Award winning actress and author of this beautiful book about her mother, The Seasons of My Mother, a memoir of love, family, and flowers. You probably know this, but we'll say it just for fun. Uh, some of the things Marsha has done, she's played Ava Gardner in Sinatra and artist Lee Krasner in Pollock, for which she won the Best Supporting Actor, Actress Oscar and the down and out Celeste and Mystic mm. River, which was got a, a gut wrencher, which was also nominated for an Academy Award. So her, she's done tons on television, including HBO's The Newsroom, which I watched epi every episode of, Damages on FX, and her current road role, boy, I'm really blowing this. <laughs> um, and I can write, but I can't <laughs> read. Uh, in her current role on CBS's Code Black, and then she's had exceptional Broadway performances, including God of Carnage. Did you see saw. that? <laughs> so spectacular. Which garnered the Best Actress Tony Award in 2009. And today she's here to talk about her mother and her mother's Alzheimer's. So welcome, Marsha Gay Thank you, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Tell us about Beverly. With pleasure. Uh, the book is called The Seasons of My Mother, and it's a book that chronicles the seasons of my mother's life. And my mother's name is Beverly Hardin. She's a demure Dallas lady. The metaphor type of descriptions I can give you, mother always would say things like, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. I wonder if anyone in the room recognizes mm -hmm. themselves in that, which, by the way, I hated that phrase. I'd be like, no, you have to speak truth to power. Or something's yeah. wrong. And you know, later I learned that there was a great value, and if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, my mother came from a family that wore pearls even in the daytime. Mm -hmm. There was just an elegance about her. My mother, uh, when I was in college, my mother would still wear a, a slip with her blue jean skirt. And you'd be like, uh, Ma, <laughs> the whole point of the blue jean skirt is you don't have to wear a slip with it, Ma. Yeah. Right? But so she had, it, she had an elegance in, uh, about her just as a, as a lady. She came from a family that had beautiful antiques and chocolate pots and china, things that I don't have. My registry was Bed Bath & Beyond, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she, when we lived in Japan, my dad was a military officer and he was a naval officer. Um, there's a wonderful story about him almost crashing into the Bay Bridge here. Yeah. And then he, he was a young pilot in the Navy. So we're just, we can segue around, right? Yeah, that's today. on my but list of things she's to like, hear about. But then she's like, Marsha Gay just segued in and out of every yeah. conversation. But slow down, slow sister. down, slow down. Sister. I got a plan for you. Okay, I got it. So can I tell him about my dad? About yeah, you okay. can tell him about So you. he was a pilot. Thad. In the Navy, and Thad was his name. And he was flying out over the Bay Bridge and he lost an engine. And so the plane was hurtling toward the Bay Bridge and he had to make a decision, would he crash into the bridge and you know kill people on the bridge or would he crash into the water and probably die and he crashed into the water and his training just jumped in and he was able to in sinking get out of the plane and make it to the top and live and he was a bit of a hero but I we have this picture of my mother kind of sitting by the bedside crying and I just know she's begging him to please change go out to sea you're a navy man go to sea get out, get out of the sky um, but we lived in Japan and my mother took up Japanese flower arranging which is called ikebana and it's a true art it's not just plunking flowers in a vase it involves texture and color and balance just you know, as an art. And that defined my mom as I was growing up. And there are five children in your family. Yep. So you're, in addition to everything you just said, your mother was raising five kids with little help from your father who was 
pretty busy as a Navy right. man. They were, the naval officers or Navy men were often stationed um, or out to sea for six months at a time. So mom was raising us in Japan on her own. That's when she took up flower arranging. And I have a chapter in the book that muses even a mother with five children can be lonely. Mm -hmm. And you think not, but there were five of us all off to school. And what mom's day was, was just a series of repetition, series of kind of house cleaning and rarely stopping to take the time to appreciate the beauty of nature and mm -hmm. what was going on around her. There's in that chapter, she, I talk about her doing that, um, but I think Ikebana was her, her release for her spirit. It was an expression of herself, her artistic expression. Yeah, and we, I just took my family to Japan over Christmas. Awesome. It was so great, and it's really meditative also, the flower arranging. Like it's, there's a, I mean, the whole country actually, the way it behaves, I felt, was in this, l there was a level of deliberateness that I was not familiar with from my own life. Right. And, and I can imagine how soothing it would be for a woman with little control to go into a place where she could very quietly, very methodically put something together and, and complete a project. Like I feel like motherhood, we're always looking for something that we can finish because right. it offers so little um, there's no little culminating events in motherhood. You know, it's an interesting thought because I always ha insist Ikebana is an art. It's not quite a hobby, it's an art. So if anybody's picked up painting or I creating clothing, whatever it is, and you look at it as an art, it becomes exponentially an expression of yourself. Mm -hmm. It becomes a way that you begin to see the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, I suppose you could say gardening too, but there's something about Ikebana. It came down from the Buddhist masters mm -hmm. and their contemplation of nature and their contemplation of, of flowers. In fact, Eckhart Tolle says, and I thought, I w had just picked up one of his books, and I thought, this is really interesting, where he said that when the human being first learned to, uh, t first took a flower home, ancient, ancient man, first took a flower home and appreciated it, that it opened up the ability for the human being to experience joy and love in a different way than previously because it wasn't utilitarian. The flower is not utilitarian mm -hmm. at all. So they took it home, kind of inviting art into the home, and that cracked open a way of seeing the world as an artist. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, well, you know, ancient man, this is what he's talking right, about. Right. And I, I love that it's about appreciation of beauty and nature. Yeah. So that's what she would do over there. It also gave her community. It gave her lots of people to kind of talk to, but she didn't want to be part of the gossip. She didn't want to be part of all the ladies gossiping on b base or whatever was going on with the naval wives on base. She wanted to appreciate the Japanese culture and just take it in and bring it home to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she was doing with Ikebana. And you were there for three years? Mm -hmm. And then you came back and where'd you go end up? I, we came back and we went to Texas um, for a brief period of time. Then we ended up in Maryland. And that was a real culture shock because in the military, you're, you, in our school, there were all different kinds of, of kids, you know, all races, all levels, all officers, enlisted men. And then to come back to Texas, it was a little bit um, shocking because they had, uh, our, my school was almost all white. I remember there was one black girl who sat by herself at a long table and at lunch and no one sat with her. And it was just so strange. And the school also had um, corporal punishment. You could like, it would smack your hands with rulers and you're like, what is going on <laughs> here? We had been in this wonderful military school with all these students. It was completely bizarre. And of course, yeah. I made friends with the girl, but we were only there for six months. And then we went to the Washington, D.C. area, which was because my father was working at the Pentagon. And that was a whole other, that was a whole other awakening, being in the Washington, D.C. area. There was um, a busing and a lot of things that went on in, in the school that required a readjustment. And th what the book does is it takes you, you know, it starts you in Japan, or it starts you, it actually starts you on May Day mm -hmm. when we lived in Garden Grove, California. And it takes you then to Japan, and it talks about how my mother exploded into this woman that I'll always remember. She just really acquired a voice there mm -hmm. that maybe she'd had traces of, but there exposed to the sensuality, as you were just saying with you and your mm -hmm. kids, exposed to this sensual world, she became a different kind of woman. Mm. And then it takes you back to Maryland. So it takes you through 
the ages of life, but it's not linear, because I tell you in the very beginning, she has Alzheimer's. I don't, I'm not trying to tell you it's a surprise, and I'm not trying to write the book like it's a progression of her demise into it. It's really not an Alzheimer's book. It's a sort of mother-daughter adventure book, yeah. but Alzheimer's is there. So you query, as I query every day, do I have it? What happens later in life when life doesn't go as you expect it? How does loss mm -hmm. affect life? And so I really wanted you to understand where we came from and what we had mm -hmm. and the richness of what we had and then think about what happens when that's lost. Yes, and uh, also just the very nature of a thing. Like if, if a woman is um, capable in a moment and then she can't remember how she did it a moment later, is she no longer capable? Or like the difference between, or the, 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 the things that affect, what is memory undoing? And what is it that we just think it's undoing, but actually she's there in, that, in yeah. the present moment. So tell us, how did she know that Alzheimer's was her fate? Well, I'll tell you first, it's um, Alzheimer's, I think of it as, I cannot make lemonade from these lemons. There's nothing good about it. And so I w can't say, on the bright side, Kelly, yeah. <laughs> there's, n there's not a bright side. That doesn't mean you can't find joy. That doesn't mean I can't find purpose. I re try to repurpose the pain to something positive by writing the book. But uh, it, it is the, m if memory is a companion, I've come to think of it as a companion, that it's supposed to be there for you when you are older. Not just a companion, it's a validator. It validates your very life. Yes, I did this. Yes, I have these children. Yes, I was in Japan. Yes, look at my flower arrangements. Yes, look at my degrees that I got. Yes, look at that was me. And, and guess what? All those things added up, and that makes my life really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And yes, I had love. And yes, I had, have, had compassion and care. Suddenly, you don't know who you are or what you are other than what people tell you. My mother said to me once, and I put that in there, people tell me all the time that I used to do these things. And I said, how do you feel about that, Mom? She said, well, it's interesting because they knew me, so they knew I did them, so that's good. And it, just in that very sentence, it's like the bottom continually falls out. But you can't live that way. You can't live with the bottom always falling out, and it's your mother. So how did mom, my mom accept it? I think with the same um, grace that she accepts so much of the rest of her life. In the early moments of understanding, and I think each of us kids in the family, one of my sisters is here today with us, Stephanie, um, who lives at the, in the Presidio here, I think in the early understandings, each of us understood it at a different point. Mm -hmm. Mom traveled a lot with me, um, and we had a, a very we had our own specific relationship. And so, I understood that she was having memory problems because she told me she would say, um, "Marcia Gay, I, I'm I'm just forgetting the simplest of things," and I think the same way I do for myself. It's like, Mom. You know, that's called CRS. My girlfriend yeah. told me it's called can't remember shit, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> that's what that is, Mom. And right. every mother in the world has it, so <laughs> you're fine. Because right. I, for I walk into the room, and I'm like, what did I come in here for? And then I retrace the entire house, and the kids are just waiting. <laughs> She'll figure it out in a minute. You know, they're yeah. just waiting for me to figure out what the hell I'm doing in the house. And so it's like when you open the microwave and you're like, oops, that's the tea from yesterday crazy. that I was heating up and <laughs> I apparently really wanted. Exactly, right. apparently. I didn't need it. Um, <laughs> so I dismissed it in the same way that I think we do dismiss. Sure. It's just memory. You can't remember you get your, put your keys, get a tile, you know, right. of all of that, which I have. So I dismissed it. <laughs> <laughs> Come That's a little product placement for tile. Oh, well, I guess it is, <laughs> but I well, I didn't mean it to be. Yeah, I could do a lot of the memory product placements if yeah. you really want to know. Um, so, uh, do you think at any level that you didn't want to think about? At every level. Yeah, because it was her biggest fear. So to validate her biggest fear, and it would have been my biggest fear for her. The thing is, every disease is a fear, right? But let's say cancer, which so there's so many cancer survivors and so many cancer fighters, and you still have your voice with cancer. Mm -hmm. So you're fighting it, you have a community, you have your voice, you know what you're fighting. F you lose your voice with Alzheimer's, and your voice becomes your children's voice, or the storytellers around your voice. So that's really hard. I didn't, it wasn't until a couple, but also, not just denial, it looks like aging. 
the early right. on, it, it, it looks just like aging and distraction. So it's truly hard to tell. We suggested that she be tested. Um, different ones of us had different opinions about what she might have had. But she was traveling with me um, it, when I, when the penny dropped for me, was in an incident with passports when mom um, kept putting her passport in her purse and then forget where she just put it. Which, by the way, has happened to me before. So it wasn't an, a great alarming situation. But on the second and third time it happened, the anguish with which she was frantically trying to remember where it was in her purse and get it and bring it out to make sure she had it and put it back again w stunned me a little. And I had offered her, oh, I'll just take it, Mom. Like I take my kids' passports all the time. I'll just take the passport and I'll take care of it. And she was vehement that I not do that. And then I began to understand, oh, she wants to put the moments together in this second here to where the string of thought slides together and there's no gap in between. And she knows she just put it in there because she remembers she just put it in there. She doesn't need to triple check that she put it in there. And then maybe a couple months later, I don't do time really well. I don't track time <laughs> really well. I don't think about her in stages. But I can tell you a couple, some months later, we were at a premiere and I'm with my hair and makeup people, um, Richard Merritt and Collier Strong, who knew me and mom from the Oscars. They had made this up in 2001. So this was, I want to say, maybe 2005, but it might have been 2007. In the book, I made sure it was um, clear, but I don't remember them so clearly. CRS. <laughs> CRS. There you go. <laughs> or, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean and it, who knows, right? I haven't had that test yet. But anyway, um, there. Uh, W I sh we had had itineraries printed out, and my mom had gone, we'd said, come back with the, let's just say, the um, red dress for tonight. And it was, the, it was the press junket that night. And so mom left, and she came back down the hall with a black dress. And we were like, no, 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 mom, go back and get the other one. And she came back with the wrong dress again. And I couldn't understand. I had told my hair and makeup people mom had been having memory loss. She was a little bit fragile, and she... Um, was, but we've been traveling, she was distracted. And they were like, uh-huh. Th when she came back the second time, they kind of looked at me and I could see again the look on mom's face it was a bit blank and I thought, but she has the schedule in her hand. Why can't she compute? Just read the schedule, mom. You she can still read that if it says Tuesday is this dress and Wednesday is this dress. And then I realized she didn't remember what day it was. Oh. She didn't know if we'd had the night before and if she'd already experienced the night before and we were on to the second day. And she'd gambled that we were on to the second day, but we were still on the first day. And so I left to take her down the hall. And when I came back, it was so sad. The trash can was so much more full with tissues and my hair and makeup guys' noses were red because they'd been crying because they knew my mom and they knew what a vital, beautiful woman she was. And the tra they'd now been you know, crying and blowing their nose. And they just looked at me when I came in like, this is a road ahead of you now. And it was still several years before she was actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She had early onset dementia and then Alzheimer's. And it was definitely her worst fear. And it's all of our worst fear, I think, on some level, because the statistics are heinous. Mm -hmm. um, now it's like 5.7 million people, I think, and 45 billion people worldwide. And they say when you're 80, you have a 50-50 chance. This one killed me because it really puts it in perspective. They say every 65 seconds, someone comes down with Alzheimer's. 65 seconds. And in the next 30 years, that's going to change to every 30 seconds someone comes down with Alzheimer's if we don't find right. the cure. And it goes on forever. I mean, it's such a challenging yeah. thing. Having had cancer, having watched people die of cancer, it's so preferable. Not that we should be ranking these things, right. but like, it's just so difficult to have something th that's chronic, that never ends. The idea of a beginning and a middle and an end right. is very different than the beginning of something that just runs all the way out for 15 the years. Or I mean, how long has your mom? She's been with it 10 years, right, Steph? A little over 10 years. And the, the end is abject loneliness. Abject loneliness. And so that is, um, that's what we try to do as caregivers is keep her not lonely keep her doing art, keep her comforted, holding hands, being uh, this power of touch, the power of love. 
And again, I, I know it's such a sad subject. I promise you the book has... <laughs> the, the book's book really beautiful. The book has laughter and joy and some really, you know, fun, the New Zealand stories, yeah. some really fun stories in it about my mother and, and, and me. Yeah. But the if, if, if it's going to change the world, if it's going to be a gift to the people, we have to talk about Alzheimer's. And I remember writing it. There was this time when... Um, I'd written the fun stuff in the beginning. Yeah, the and easy stuff. The easier stuff, right? And the youth, and my, I had this neighbor, Alvin Sargent, I was telling you about. He's um, a screenwriter who wrote Ordinary People, Paper Moon, Julia, ama Spider-Man, amazing screenwriter. He was 85, and I had a tremendous crush on him. I still do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, he is the one who said to me, go home and write for 20 minutes at a time. And I did, and so he kind of inspired me to write the book. And he also said, take the cap off, which you do this so I mean, you, this is just like I so love your writing. He, but he said, take the cap off, March, because I was trying to control everything. But I didn't want it to be like, in 1959, I was, right. I was just like boring myself talking about that. Yeah. So I, I wanted, and as soon as he said, take the cap off, suddenly my mother was flying in the sky at times, or she was holding hands with the moon. And when we were on a flight over to Japan, and she's holding the hands with the moon, I thought, well, that feels more organic to me. That feels like how I'm thinking, and that feels how I'm writing is in metaphor, and, and, and a kind of a lyricism feels more right to me. So that's how it... I wrote it, but then I had to get to the end, and there had been some ugly stuff. I had been divorced, and I didn't take it. Like, there are some women, I admire them. They're like, they they never look ugly. They never cry when they're, they never look ugly when they cry. <laughs> and they'll be like, I kind of admire them, maybe not really. But, they, um, <laughs> but, they, but they'll say things like, you know, one door closed and another door opened, and that wasn't me. I yeah. was a heaping puddle on the floor with snot rolling out of every possible <laughs> you nose. Know, I mean, I was heartbroken, and I yeah. believed that marriages last forever, and certainly that mine would. And so my mom had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I was in the middle of a divorce, and, uh, and I was uh, finishing homeschooling my kids, and everything was, you know, making us go, Wait, who are we? So in the face of loss, who are we? In the face of, when you can't define yourself anymore by the things around you, like houses. I think about those people who lose their houses and fires and earthquakes and they live there forever and suddenly, who are they when you don't have those definitions? And I stopped writing. The book was due out last Mother's Day and I just stopped writing. It was supposed to be a Mother's Day gift to my mom and I couldn't, and I knew it had to be ugly if I was going to write it. It had to be ugly like, if I'm going to play a character, I'm going to play what's ugly about them because then we'll recognize ourselves, I think, in them. But I stopped, and then I got really pissed at myself again. Being pissed at yourself is such a great motivator on <laughs> some <laughs> level. <laughs> I would just my advice from Academy Award winning I, actress uh, Marsha Gay. Yeah, well. Yell at yourself every yes, now and then. Occasionally, my dad had this phrase where he'd always go, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, Marsha Gay. And I was like, what the hell are bootstraps, Dad? Right. Like, I wear high heels, but right. I'll pull myself up by those if I have to. And it would always be that kind of a thing where you can sit around and wallow, and sometimes you have to, but then you absolutely have to. Is there, what is that um, cliched wonderful saying where success isn't about whether you fell down, it's about yeah, how, how you, get you get up. Yeah. back up. So I would think these wonderful little cliche meditation books and uh, eventually, you know, got back up and finished writing the book and wrote all the ugly parts and that was the hard part to write. You were very generous about um, showing yourself being impatient or stingy um, or irritated because I think with long-term conditions, it is totally impossible to be the caretaker with constant grace. Right. And I think it's really kind of gutsy. Of You're the you. master of it. Yeah, but really. I'm not Marsha Gay Harden. Like, <laughs> nobody, I mean, nobody has ideas about me being a wonderful person. Like, they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they probably have you on a pretty big pedestal. And <laughs> so I just thought it was really generous in that way that you were showing that stuff. Was it hard for you to show yourself being snippy or... The snippy part wasn't as hard because I fi it was the heartbroken part. I didn't want people to know about that I had been um, hurt 
you know, that was the hard part. I wanted to seem like a strong warrior and I didn't want to seem needy. Oh, is there anything worse than being needy, right? We hate seeming needy. And so there I was being as needy as hell. But the snippy part felt normal to me because I feel like every mother, every woman can understand people, you understand the moment that you're impatient with your parent. Yeah. You understand that moment when you're like, just come on. Like I was living in New York City. Have a lot of you visited New York? Yep. Yeah. So you know how if you're walking down Times Square and you dare to stop in the middle of Times Square, <laughs> you get mowed down by everybody in Times Square. Right. And my mother would want to stop and take a picture and look at I'd be like, come on, Mom, we've got to go. And I liked it. That's the real admission. I liked the espresso energy. I liked the speed. I liked honking at other cars when I would drive <laughs> <laughs> in New York City. I just figured it was communication. You're right. like, move it. The light changed. And, yeah. and so that makes me feel good. made me feel good. And I felt powerful, I think. Jaywalking. I'm meant to jaywalk. Uh, you know what? I like jaywalking. I too. love jaywalk. I personally think it's more safe than in, Cal in Santa Monica. They have those lights that change, and then people just walk across the street without a care in the world. They don't even look to the right or the left to see yeah. if a car is there. Because the light changed and they're pedestrians and there they go. But hello, if, if a truck pulled up and stopped for a second, you don't see it. I mean, I've almost killed people and you think, yeah. you know, jaywalk when the cars aren't coming. That's right. how you get across that straight. So <laughs> I would be snippy with my mother for sure about things like just move it. Or there was this story in New Zealand when we're in should I tell that story? Yeah, tell the story. Okay, so we're in New Zealand, and I had, um, before New Zealand, I had been dating a bagpiper. Uh, <laughs> as okay. one does. As one does. <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> Who occasionally wore a skirt <laughs> while bagpiping. But did he wear underwear right? in the skirt is really the That's question. That's for me to know, Kelly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell you what, you'll sell more copies. <laughs> and let's just say occasionally no underwear because no. the gift was he was, I was sure he was going to, we were going to go to New Zealand. I had to go back to do some looping on this um, film and we were going to go and he, I was 100% sure I had it planned. He was going to propose to me on the heaths of New Zealand mm. went between playing the bagpipes and <laughs> We were going to get married. I was already in my 30s. I was practically a spinster. And um, <laughs> so I was sure that was going to happen. But he broke up with me conveniently right before the trip. To me, and I could take nobody on the trip, although you could still change tickets at the time in somebody's name. And I was sobbing, as I um, want to do, <laughs> as you can tell, when relationships end. And I'm with my therapist, and she says, well, why don't you just invite your best friend? I'm like, my best friend's my mother. I can't invite my mother. It won't be romantic at all. So the entire trip, I punished my mother because I invited my mother. So I punished her the whole trip for not being my bagpiping boyfriend with no underwear. And, <laughs> and a big diamond and, ring. And a big diamond and uh, at one point we're driving around looking for directions and uh, we're, you know, just map days. It's no GPS, it's nothing. And we're trying to read these maps and th all the signs are written in Maori, which means they're really hard to pronounce. And then sometimes in Maori, the WH, you have to pronounce with an F if it's a word. So like Wanganui would be Fanganui. But if there was a K in the word, it sounded like a curse word. So mom wouldn't say it. So she would only <laughs> pronounce it like with the, with the American. And I was like, mom, it's a Maori word. Word. Yeah. You're not cursing, and every just everything she did got on my nerves, and everything I did got on her nerves. And then at some point, we passed this sign that we were supposed to turn at, and she goes, "Oh, there goes Waka Papa." And I'm like, "What, mother?" And she goes, "Okay, fuck a Papa, <laughs> fuck a Papa." <laughs> And she was like, and we, we got out of the car. We had like, <laughs> we were laughing so hard. We had to pee behind the rental car, like yeah. the, the sheep in the background. And then we go back to the hotel later and, and she's like reading all her beautiful flower books and she's on the bed in a lavender nighty and she has all these lessons and she just kind of makes a way for me in her little garden of books and I crawl in and she teaches me all these lessons about flowers. But the killer is when she takes my hand and she says, don't worry, honey, you will find love. Mm. And you're like, <sighs> she got that yeah. that's why I was being all those a little bitch. She got that that's why I was... <laughs> doing that because I was so afraid that I was yeah. not just not going to find love, but that I wasn't worthy of love, mm. you know, because if he broke up with me, then 
my wasn't where I was in that thing that we do, and it takes a while to recover. And so she was, that's who she was. And so writing those parts seemed honest to me. Mm -hmm. I know my kids will be like, Mom, I think I'm the least helicopter mom in the world. But apparently, I'm even a little bit of a helicopter mom to them. So I know when they write whatever they write, there's going to be big passages about me sneaking reading their diaries because I did. Um, yeah. <laughs> So did I. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> We're supposed to. Yeah. Um, so I know that there'll be things like that, and that's honest. But it was the, the other part that was a little bit hard. Yeah. I think it's interesting about moms. Whenever somebody in our group of friends says, oh, my mom's coming next week, everyone goes, oh. And I think, why? Why is that I hate that it, the too. Reaction? I'm so glad like, you said that's that. That's what's coming for us. Is that what George is going to say when I, when I come all the way across the country to see her when I'm 75 right. years old? Is she gonna, are her friends going to be like, oh, how long is she staying? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or the mother-in-law Do you thing. need me to come over? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Well, I say even in the book, I hate that mother-in-law thing, too. I absolutely yeah. hate it when, when the one of the sp spouses says, you know, my parents are coming and the reaction from the other spouse is like, oh, yeah. the in-laws. And I would say I was always grateful to my ex that he didn't have that about my mother. He embraced my mother. He loved the fact that I wanted her to travel with us all the time. She would. It was like a little threesome. She was always there. And we pretended like we were bringing her to help us with the kids whenever I'd go someplace. But I always hired people at the hotel or wherever to help us with the kids because I just wanted mom to be there for the parties. Yeah. And for the fun of it all. And I was really grateful. That was some, a good thing about my ex. He, he loved my mom. Yeah. Well, that makes it hurt even more, actually. Right. I interview my kids' boyfriends pieces. now. So just. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's a good part of the puzzle. Your mom made you try out for your first play. She did. She did. I, I was living in Washington, D.C., and I had graduated from University of Texas. And I'd been to Greece, to Germany, and then Texas in schools. And so I'm living in D.C., kind of getting myself together um, because I don't want to move straight to New York, but I know I'm eventually going to. And my mother, oh, I've been singing at the Gaslight Club, which oh, was this. Oh, right, remember? You were a gaslight I was girl. a Gaslight Girl. So tell you these guys even well, what you that had is. to wear. It was like a private gentleman's club, but it wasn't a strip club. Uh, <laughs> but it was pretty damn close. It like was there not were fishnets. close. There Every, were fishnets there were fish, involved. There were fishnets and chokers, but you kept your clothing on, <laughs> um, and and your hair had to be pretty. But it was like you served drinks in high heels and fishnets. There was like a dining room downstairs, but you had to sing at the piano. So there was a piano. There, I don't know if I've never been to a Playboy Club, but I don't think this piano is there. But the little <laughs> outfit you wore was like a little like gun smoke ki kitty gun smoke thing, velvet meets Playboy outfit with fishnets and high heels. And <laughs> then you had to go up and you had to be at the piano and sing. But I'm not a great singer, so I had one song that I knew I could hit the notes to, but not a elongate the notes to, just hit the notes to, just be like, I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. And I would, let it, like, some yeah. people go, letter. Yeah. You know, like, that's how you're supposed to sing it. And I'd be like, hit the compi, do, 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 do. when am I done? When am I done? You know, so one day these billionaires <laughs> gave me a hundred dollar bill not to sing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you get the picture. <laughs> so I <laughs> gone out to my mother's house and uh, my mom and dad's, and I was having breakfast with them. My mom pulled out this little article, and she from the newspaper. She said, hey, "Look, honey, there's auditions for I ought to be in pictures at the old theater of a Alexandria. It was like a l the little theater." And I said, "Oh, mom, it's a musical. I'm not going to audition for it." And she said, "No, honey, I don't think it's a musical. It's a Neil Simon play." And of course, I know everything. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, mom." I know it's a Neil Simon play, but it's a musical. It's a not a play. It's a musical. I'm not going to audition. And it turns out we went back and forth and back and forth until she said, well, if it is a musical, just don't sing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Ma, we called. It wasn't a musical. It was a play. I auditioned with the play. I got the part. Um, my parents came to see it. I got good reviews by the critics. I made them into a big brag sheet that I took everywhere. Anybody who wanted to ha hire me for anything, I'd be like, look what the critics said, okay? And I showed them all, and eventually when I was in New York, I showed this brag sheet to people in New York, and it's kind of how I ended up getting my first jobs. So I can literally trace it back to that moment when mom was just going, go on, honey, go on. And it's in a way, it's the lesson is do the things you're afraid of. Do yeah. the things you think you can't do. 
I want to read something that I thought was so interesting as a mom, like I took note of this, which is that they were talking, going back and forth about whether she should do the audition, and she said, in the silence that ensued, I could feel and resented my mother's longing for me. She ran her fingers through her soft black curls and smiled, neither pushy nor disapproving, only hopeful. It irritated me that she thought I was stronger than she was. And I feel that sometimes with my so kids glad. that are like, give me room to not be ready for the thing you think I'm ready for. Yes. And yet, she nudged you just right. Well, I mean, your whole life unfolded from there. And maybe it was going to unfold from anyway. But maybe you got a little jump on it because she saw something. I think so. And I think the irritation was also, I didn't want to see her as less strong than me. Because that had happened also in New Zealand. Suddenly I'm leading the way in the airport. And I'm, you know, she would ask me things like, well, when we get to the restaurant, honey, do you think they'll have coffee? And I think, I don't know, Ma. <laughs> I've never been there. Or she would just questions like that. It was like this weird thing that would happen between us. And I felt so alone in my irritation. But that's one of the reasons why I like talking to people. They're like, yes, we've been through that too. Yeah. And ultimately I realized it was sort of, I call it the great migration of age where we realize we see better. You know, I, I don't pay a bill anymore that my kids don't pay and sign at the restaurants because I can't see the damn thing. Mm -hmm. So at first, I know they didn't like seeing me as losing my eyesight because that means I'm getting old. That means I'm not there for them in every way. But now they understand that m mom, you know, is aging. There's ultimately a migration before the ultimate caretaking where we're the stronger ones, where they, they defer to us. And I don't, I, I wasn't ready for it. I right. hadn't expected, maybe we never expect it. Yeah. It comes upon us by surprise. And suddenly you go, oh, I'm an adult. Mm -hmm. I'm an adult and they're aging and they're still my mom, but I'm an adult. And, and also, and we can be friends. That was the other thing. We yeah. That was later. We, that we could be friends if we didn't have to be mother-daughter. She, I wanted to smoke and curse like I loved to do. And uh -huh. um, she... We got to go out. We got to go out. I'm a big potty mouth. Yeah. yeah. MF is my favorite word. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> ever. It's so versatile, isn't well, it? It's really versatile. Yeah. I say, if you drop a hammer on your toe, what is the first thing that comes out of your mouth? And that is your go-to curse word, right? Right. For my father, it was goddamn son of a bitch. So there were a couple yeah. of them, right? And everything was that. Because he was, like he said, he was a salty old naval officer. Moms? Stephanie, what is moms? Did she have a curse word? Damn, she didn't. My mother didn't have a curse word. Yeah. yeah. Serious, serious. But I you are a lot alike. Like at one point in it, I you know. say you have, I, you have a lot in common with your yeah. mom. And I wondered if layered in that was this fear that you might have the same story might unfold for you. Well, that's so how do you process that part yeah, of it? Yeah, that's a good question. That's the fear now. Um, because I feel like I'm so like my mom down to body type, down to, you know, a, a bunion or something. I mean, it's like down to <laughs> the the my cold feet. Oh, right? I have cold feet, too. I have cold feet. Oh, my God. We're we should like go out. <laughs> 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 uh, so I do fear it. So I did that. Has anyone done the 23 and Me? The 23 and Me thing? Nobody in this whole room? I you would think in San Francisco oh. we would have some, yeah. Yeah, so it's the genetic testing where you can figure out your ancestry. And, of course, I was totally hoping I had, like, African-American and Spanish <laughs> and Native American Indian in me. No, I'm as wasp as they come. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can also, you make a choice. You pay a little bit more for the choice. You can make a choice to see your medical, your medical genetic history potential. So they ask you, are you sure you want to know? Which, of course, like at first you were, but then they asked me, I'm like, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> Maybe I don't. But I did want to know because one of the things that's happened with mom's Alzheimer's is it's allowed me to become an advocate and an activist for it. And I thought, you better put your money where your mouth is, MGH. And if you're going to, I do uh, advocate for early testing. And for n I'm one who would want to know. Totally respect that a lot of people wouldn't want to know, but I do want to know because I, it's a, for me, it would be a gift to my children to know. Mm -hmm. And so I did the 23andMe, and I didn't have the gene. It's called the APOE gene. I don't have it. Doesn't mean I won't, I won't get it. I don't know if my mother has it. I'm going to have her do the testing too, but um, or maybe she's already done it. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, I don't have it. And so the next thing to do would be do a, a the scan, the brain scan, to see. 
but I'm afraid of it every day. I wake up anxious every morning, mm -hmm. not just for me, but for my mother. I go to bed, think she's the last thing I think about at night, she's the first thing I think about in the morning. And part of it is guilt. I, c I, don't, I c don't think one can have an Alzheimer's family member and not feel guilty just because you couldn't take it away, just because you couldn't um, alleviate, you weren't there. You live in another state. Literally, that you didn't give up your life to be there for them in their life. That's what you feel. I mean, you gave up tons when your dad got sick even with cancer, mm -hmm. right? You gave up months and months to go be, and mm -hmm. your family said it's okay. Mm -hmm. But there was no end in sight with this, and you can't do it. So g guilt, I mean, all of those things play yeah. a part in understanding how to go f move forward. There's also the complexity of uh, often f there's financial considerations yeah. and there's also with five kids you probably ended up with five distinct opinions right. about next steps, about the sequence of events, about the pace of care. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that for all the people who are listening thinking, right. oh my God, but I got my sister to worry about and my brother and they want him to, they want my dad to live in Philly and they want my dad to live in Baltimore and somebody else wants him to come to California and yeah. it's just so riddled with complexity well, and dynamics. It's true. Death tears families apart anyway and Alzheimer's absolutely can tear a family apart. And all the things you said, people live in different places, people have different opinions. One person usually ends up being the main caregiver. And that did occur in our fami family too. We had to make financial choices to, um, because you don't know how long it's going to last. Mom has been living with her for over 10 years now. So we had to make financial choices to move her out of the home she had been living in, to move her into another family home. And the main takeaway was that the what always would guide us was, is she safe? Is she safe? Is she safe? Is she cared for? Is she loved? Is she safe? W there were different opinions about what we should do. Of course. And they were, um, they do create conflict, right? But you just have to keep asking yourself that question. And that's why I'm such an advocate also for that really important window that comes from early detection. Because in that window, the Alzheimer's patient and the family give the patient the opportunity to be in charge of their own destiny. And that's the window when you suspect something might be going on with one of your loved ones. Even though it's the scariest thing in the world, you want to test them so that you can make sure, if they have it, you know where it's going, that you can say to them those horribly difficult questions. How do you want to live? How do you want to die? At what point are you okay with being in a home? How are we going to handle the finances? Who is your durable power? Who is your medical power? Who is going to be making decisions for you and you can no longer make decisions? Now, they can tell you that so that you know at this moment in time, the kids are released from that burden of being the th thought. The It's almost like this moral thought in a way because what the parent wanted you feel is on moral grounds and you release yourself of that and then you, because they, it's what they wanted. They said they wanted it. It's right there. And and, you know, we can make judgments within there what they said they want, but that's why I want wanted to do that for my kids. I didn't want them to have to go, no, she would want this, and no, she'd want this. You want I wanted them to go, guys, at a certain point, if I haven't moved to Oregon, you know, if I have it, <laughs> then you can feel comfortable putting me in a home, and if I know that I have it, I might even pick the home where I want to be and structure the finances so that I could be there. Yeah. The scary thing, we were talking about this a little bit in the back, is that you know, uh, if, if Medicare and Medicaid don't remain part of our American society for our seniors and ultimately for us, I can only use one word for it. We're fucked. It's fucked. Because the people who are going to be uh, financially responsible most likely will be women in their 50s. There's a huge propensity of women in their 50s who are divorced. So their finances have already shifted. And they'll be the caretakers for the parents and there's not money to take care of it. So the parent's going to come live with them. And so it's a very, with no money, I mean, it's to look at the baffling situation of the finances, because you mentioned it is expensive. It's expensive to have caregivers. It's expensive to give up your job to be a caregiver. It's difficult to raise your children and be a caregiver if your kids have already gone off. I mean, the Alzheimer's Association says they don't like kids being the caregivers to their parents because the kid, you oftentimes it alters your relationship with them and you literally give up your life. 
So they like the idea that you could hire caregivers who are trained, or now there's more cutting edge places where you can, there are homes where you can put your parent, but when we were looking at some of the Alzheimer's care units, they were, you know, you were 100% sure that the patient was drugged, that they were sitting kind of to the side or playing with balloons, and we said, absolutely not for my mom. One of the places we looked at had just had an incident of elder abuse, and we were said, no way in hell. So we, she's now beautifully, comfortably safe and in a beautiful little home on a lake that my grandfather had built in the 60s. She's surrounded by love. She has one sister who cares for her a lot. She has another sister who was just down there doing art with her and painting and doing watercolors at a table. Steph and I feel guilty that we're not there more, that we visit when we, we can. My brother's down there. So um, it, it does tear people apart, but eventually you have to come together just for their safety. Yeah, and and the, to, to your point, uh, to underline your point, uh, this is why it's early detection is super, super, super valuable. There are some great moments um, like the song Tequila. Oh, yeah. So yes. will you talk a little bit about music and the role that it can play in terms of like reaching into a Alzheimer's yeah. patient and stirring something? That's a good point. Um, we... Uh, You've probably heard that music can uh, spark memory in an Alzheimer's patient. Familiar music from the time when when they what they were listening to, um, and it does make me think. My mother, the beautiful thing, my mother d hasn't changed. My, the essence of my mother is the same. She's still this graceful, beautiful lady, and we're lucky because a lot of times patients can go off into aggression or they can go off into lascivious behavior. For instance, my mother did not, but. Um, she always loved music. She's not now listening to ACDC, right? That's why, you know, <laughs> something's changed for mom. Um, and so uh, when we were kids, uh, you're talk Kelly's talking about an incident when my dad would put on jazz all the time. And so before he would go off to sea, he'd put on jazz. And I wrote about a time, well, a memory that I had of we would go to Taco Bell the day before he would be going out to sea for six months at a time because it was our treat to eat out. You know, military families don't make tons and tons of money. And um, so mom, made, she's a mother, she made the, she made the meal for all of us. So we'd go to Taco Bell and then we'd come home and he'd put on kind of Mexican music and he <laughs> would, right? And we would dance around the house. And so one of the songs we danced to was tequila. And we would play hide and seek and we'd whip these napkins around our head and <laughs> dance tequila. And it was really fun. And so years later, I'm now visiting my mom in Texas and I've brought these little Bose speakers and I've put in some music and I'm playing the song tequila, and she kind of, tequila on the word, like in time with it, she remembered something and she sings it because it was a West Montgomery version, right? So the words are different. And then later, I play Pachelbel's Canon for her, which she always loved Pachelbel's Canon. And she's kind of astonished at the Bose speakers, which I've just explained to her what they are. And then I have to explain them again that they're these wonderful Bose speakers. And she's listening to the music. And she does seem to spark to not really memory, I'm going to say. She doesn't really go, oh, I remember when that played. But she lifts out of a place that she is. It's like maybe th if there's a blankness, she lifts out of the place that she is. And th the very last chapter of the book is, um, or the last moment of the book, we're driving um, with our caregiver and we're driving to church. And this Sarah Vaughn comes on, um, Sarah Vaughn song comes on, and it's um, about how seasons change and how hummingbirds fly. And in the story, mom kind of leaves and goes up into the clouds with some angels, and Tony Kushner's angels. Yeah. And uh, while the Sarah Vaughn song is on, and she'll occasionally just remember one word and whisper it and, and seem to connect to some memory of that. But when they've really done real therapy with people with, with music, they're a little bit earlier, right? So there's a certain point when even music doesn't reach them. There was a great CBS. Did anybody see the CBS 60 Minutes episode? And it was really pretty devastating because remember in, the, in it there was a moment when the woman was touched by music and then there's a moment when it goes past. So mom is still uh, where she can be touched by music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, will you tell us your Oscar story? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. Uh, it's, I hope it's not too long because the parts that are, the, it starts with me thinking about um, 
when I first told my parents that I'd been nominated, because I didn't think I'd been nominated. Pollock was a really small film, but there's a lot of buzz about it. So I'd called home, and remember I told you my mother was a part of Japanese flower arranging groups, and they were called ch different chapters and garden club groups. Well, she got all her news always from the garden club group. So well, I called home to say, Mom! I was nominated for an Academy Award. And she says, I know, darling, I know. Hold on. Because all the garden club had already told her. Yeah. So she goes, she hands the phone. She goes, here's your father. And dad just goes, fan-fucking-tastic. Right? That's like <laughs> his response. So that's my dad, this naval officer. So now I'm back in California, and um, dad decides that he's going to design my dress. I'm like, what, you, naval officer turned dress designer? What's going on here? And he's like, I want you to wear a champagne pink. And I'm like, dad. <laughs> I'm a size eight. I'm not going to wear champagne pink because I feel fat at a size eight. And he's yeah. like, no, oh, you got to look elegant, damn it. I want you to look elegant. So my stylist, Jessica, um, says, give me the phone, Wash. Give me the phone because she's over visiting. She's hearing me like, oh, dad, I can't. I'm like clutching my stomach and feeling all my fat. And he's like, so she goes, give me the phone. She goes, hi, Captain. He's like, hello. And she says, so, oh, you're so right. She needs to look elegant. He's like, goddamn right. And she says, uh, she... <laughs> She needs and champagne pink. What a great idea. And I'm like, I'm horrified. Champagne pink, no. And then she goes, listen, we're going to take care of her. She's going to look elegant. But, Captain, let me ask you something. Do you like cleavage? It's like, hell yes. <laughs> <And> she's like, <laughs> like okay. She's going to look elegant with cleavage. So she designs this beautiful dress for me. Mm. Randolph Duke designed it. We go to the Oscars. We are, um, we're wearing millions of dollars of jewels. We had been told that we could have $500,000 worth of jewels with no bodyguard. And then well, I was like, that's going to be plenty, $500,000 worth. Are you kidding me? No bodyguard. We don't want a bodyguard. We want it to be just family. Right, Mom? And Mom's like, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> as long as he stays in the background. Right. Right. In the right. background. And a diamond or two for me. She's like, well, so where? Because, of course, you wear them. You give them back at the end of the night. So then they get wind that the dress is really grand. And then the Harry Winston says, okay, she can have a million dollars worth of diamonds with no bodyguard. And I'm like, Mom, we can have a million dollars. We're in a fitting, right? There's bodyguards. They're showing us the jewels. There's dress designers. Everybody's in this little fitting. And I'm yelling over the partition, Mom, a million dollars worth of jewels. No bodyguard. So we're good, right? No bodyguard. Mom's like, hmm. <laughs> oh, no, a million. Because she's like, well, there needs to be some for me. And then she's pushing some around. She goes, and some for Stephanie, because Stephanie's coming down. <laughs> right? So so, so, so it, we go, we look at them. And every time I put on a necklace and a ring, people gasp. And every time I take it off, they're like, uh, I put it on, they gasp. And so at the end of the day, we get $4 million worth of jewels and a bodyguard. <laughs> and we go through the Oscars. I win. It's, I'm like the second one up. I win. Astonished, and here's something funny: is that when I won, I didn't. It wasn't a pure moment. It wasn't a moment that you would imagine, where it's just elation, and you're walking up to the podium, and you're like, "Da da da da, I'm here." I won, and I felt elated, and then I felt badly for the other actresses who didn't win, and then I was worried that maybe Nicolas Cage, who was giving me the award, hadn't wanted me to win, so. <laughs> And then I was going to go up and get it from him. And what was his face going to look like? And then I was like, I'm really so glad that I'm here. And then I was like, what if Ed doesn't win? And I was wondering, did I hug all the right people? You know, my mind was just insecure as I was going up there, elated and insecure, elated and insecure. Yeah. So it wasn't pure. And I look out and I'm thinking, well, I want to see where my mom and dad are. And it wasn't hard because my dad, mom, my dad was standing up about four rows behind where I've been with his arms over his head going, bravo! <laughs> <laughs> Just literally yelling bravo. Mom was trying to pull him down. I was praying that Spielberg wasn't sitting behind him because I'd never get a yeah. job. And then at the end of the night, dad has gone home. He wasn't feeling well. Mom and me and my lawyer are in the car and my ex, now my ex, my daddy is his name. And we were all going back to the hotel and this chase ensues on the highway. And at for, and it was I thought it was paparazzi for sure because now I was famous. I had just won an Oscar and I was thrilled with every bit of it. And my husband was filming it all. My uh, and then the bodyguard goes, it could be jewel thieves. <gasps> At which point, my mother began clutching at her jewels and going for the sunroof, ready to throw them out the sunroof, oh <laughs> saying, like, I want to live. I want to live. I'm like, Ma, Ma, it's paparazzi. I'm sure it's paparazzi. You know, because now I'm yeah, famous, right, OJ. Right, it's one, one, of yeah, one of those. And so we go all through this whole, this whole thing. 
and we end up, you know, pulling into a police station, and they jump on the jewel thieves, paparazzi. What were they? We never knew. We're like staring out the top of the sunroof. Mom covertly puts her earrings back on because we still had three minutes left to get to the hotel. <laughs> so Cinderella was not going out without a splash. Oh. And we get to the hotel, and we take off our jewels, and the bodyguard says, by the way, it was paparazzi. And I'm like, <gasps> yeah. And he says, they thought it was Russell Crowe. hate him. Oh, my God. Um, okay. Uh, we have 11 minutes left, and I want to ask some questions that sure. the audience great. wants to know. So I'm going to give you a little bundle okay, of questions, great. and then you can magically spin it into a single answer. Okay, got it. Um, so one question is really interesting, which is, has being an actress helped you deal with all the difficult roles that you've been, that life has handed you? Hang on. Um... Is there any evidence of, of anything that offsets the disease? Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, older people, especially women, are often ignored by the media and society. So any thoughts on how to change that? And how do you get people to have difficult conversations? Do you have any tips on how to get a family to have the difficult conversations that long-term care generally involves? Okay, I'll jump in. There's a place called the Lou Ruvo Center in Las Vegas. It's a Frank Geary building, and it's the cutting edge right now of Alzheimer's research, and it's also a hospital. And I was just there, and this great doctor named Dr. Cummings talked about this drug that kind of sounds like abracadabra, but that's not what it is, and they can't release the name of it yet. But it is the first drug that they're all really excited about. And when you see a bunch of stoic scientists getting excited about something, you know it's, it's good. And they think it will cause a stasis with the Alzheimer's, the, with the plaque spread. So it's, we don't know the, the cause of it, and it won't cure it, but it may just stop it at a certain point. So that's really, really, really good news, and we continue to look for the cause of it. And if you go online, you can pull up any of the Broken Brain series, any of those um, brain talks right now, and they all talk about the gut-brain relationship. They talk they call di um, Alzheimer's diabetes 3, so there's a gluten and a sugar uh, aspect to it. So you can do all that research, uh, exercise. The bad news is you have to sweat. The good news is it helps. Um, so those are things that we can do for it because uh, it, because it's moved so vastly, huge. The numbers are so huge. It has to be some lifestyle thing happening right now, right. and that's why they say when you look at anthropological man, they we we grew up walking. We, we learned how to think walking 12 miles a day, basically, a nomadic man did. And there was no sugar. And that's 50,000 years of body and genetic programming toward a certain way of learning in the brain, a certain way of moving in life, um, a certain way of eating. And it's only the last 200, and then 100, and then 50, that sugar's in everything, and we basically barely move. You know, mm -hmm. we like this, eating a lot of sugar. So that makes sense when you think about it anthropologically. Our bodies are not trained to live like we do today. So that's one thing. Um, and there is hope. Uh, why more women than, well, the question was why w more women than men, but Maria Shriver did talk about that, and she does talk about that a lot. And sleep is a huge factor. And, of course, I think who's more sleep-deprived than young mothers? Um, but that's just me armchairing it. More women in the media, I think moments like this, I think moments like what we're all doing, I think paying attention to, to women and um, understanding that our stories are absolutely important. And if you're a woman boss, making sure that you're e paying, doing equal pay and that we're advocating and more than going, the marches were amazing, but then turning them into more, um, turning them into action. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what was, an, what was the first one, the first question? Hard, hard conversations like how oh, do you help a yeah. family? To jump, all I can say is you jump in. And, or, and you can maybe get someone from the Alzheimer's Association. They will come to you, or you get a doctor, you get a therapist. You can set up mediators to come to you to have these conversations because they are hard, and families do think different things, and, people, and it's scary. People are scary. I know death is coming, and I've always not been really um, afraid to have the conversation, but I think that's the attitude. Probably more of us are braver than we think we are if we're just confronted with how to be brave. Mm -hmm. So you jump in and you get a little help and support jumping in. Um, there's some uh, Kimberly Williams Paisley's book 
It's called Where the Light Gets In. And she has a lot of really good resources at the end of it for uh, associations. And of course, the Alzheimer's Association is really good. And then that very first question was about being an actress and playing all those roles oh over yeah. the years. And does that prepare you for these moments, divorce and family struggles and Alzheimer's? No. 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 You I might be the only honest woman in the entire uh, state of California that's really. Because it hurts just as bad. You know, I had beliefs just as much as the next person about my life. I never thought I was a statistic. You know, we had tragedy in the family early. My brother lost his children in a fire, and my um, my mother gets Alzheimer's. I'm divorced. I never thought I was. We don't think we're statistics. Bad stuff happens to other people until it happens to you, mm -hmm. and then you have to call on your own resources to rise to whatever is your true character. And your true character is how you deal with the problem, right? Um, so no, I think acting maybe gives me a voice to speak about it. I'm I'm comfortable translating feelings into dialogue, and into you know that's what we do. It's all about language, and I do love language, so I am comfortable. We have to have our emotions on our surface, to so we can call on them in any second. Um, so I, I do want to, I don't know if we give it, gave up for 11 minutes, but you did make me think about something my mother said, which is a tremendous resource, um, and it's at the very end of the book. I had come to the end of the book, and I was afraid to stop, because I thought, what if there's some big reveal that I didn't know about, and now the book is done, and I don't have it, and so people won't know about it for her. And in some ways, it was what I always knew, but it was an important reveal. So I say, Mom. Whatever you're thinking about, I'm FaceTiming her. Whatever you're thinking about, Mom, I want you to tell me. Whether it's gardening or flowers or sex or God or your family or love or whatever you're thinking about, just tell me. And I can see that she starts to say something and then she kind of stops. And I said, what? And she goes, God. We're not, a, we're not a you know super religious family. She goes, God. And I said, you're thinking about God? And she says, yes. And I said, what do you think about God? And she says, love. Love. It happens to everybody. The better the thoughts, the better the thinking. And that's mom's way of saying that thinking beautiful thoughts, filling your brain with beautiful thoughts, is actually really good for the brain. And it really is. Anger and stress and um, friction and conflict and all, and staying on things and not Resentment. giving, mm -hmm. it's bad for the brain. And uh, so that's my mother's gift in a way of what's good for the brain and that she said it with the language that she had. Uh, basically, you know, I'm like, okay, uh, Oprah Winfrey, meet Guru, meet my mother. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> God is love. Yeah. And fill your head with beautiful thoughts. And that was her gift. What I tell you, this is a really beautiful book. And I can't recommend it highly enough for anyone who wants to reflect on their relationship with their mother or even with their own children. And especially, I think we should be buying extra copies and giving them to all the people we know who have a parent who has Alzheimer's right now because it's really good company on that very long road. So Marsha Gay Harden, thank, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a gavel moment now, it says <laughs> it here. Um, we also thank everyone here as well as our audience on the radio, on television, on the internet. This program has been part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We want to remind everyone that there are books outside, and we're happy to sign them. And I'm Kelly Corrigan, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>